National Socialist Party conquered Europe through murder, torture, intimidation, and terror. And that's exactly what we're going to do to them. We will be cruel. Hi, welcome to another episode of Bomb Squad Matinee. And I'm just going to get a little message out of the way here. Fuck Nazis. True. Everyone agrees. I'm your host of Master of Ceremony, Tanner Richard Kraft, and with me I have... Gorlami. I'm the third best Italian speaker. <laughs> That's a good poll. That's a good poll. And judging by the Italian speaking references, whatever Tim said in my little fuck Nazis, we are talking about my personal favorite Quentin Tarantino movie, Inglorious Bastards. But before we get right into Inglorious Bastards, I have a little bit of a warm up question. What's your favorite movie that takes place during World War II? Tim, we'll start with you. Okay, this was one of the ones I thought might end up being the question, so uh, the answer I have ready is not a fun answer, uh, and that is Grave of the Fireflies. All uh, right! <laughs> great I, film. Yeah, it is a great film, and I think it's the World War II film that stands out in my mind just because it was a much different perspective on World War II than anything I had seen when I first saw that film. Um, it really puts you in the perspective of the Japanese people, which, I mean, it's a Japanese movie, so it was for that audience specifically, but seeing it as an American kind of highlights their perspective in a way that, uh, not a lot of our movies show. Uh, so definitely check that out, uh, it, it, no no going in that it's just going to be a real sad time, but uh, it's definitely absolutely worth a watch. Back to you, Tanner. Oh, it, it, it's a tearjerker. It's, and, and it'll make you ugly cry. Yeah. Bennett, how about you? What's your favorite World War II era movie? Um, Probably Lord of the Rings Return of the King. <laughs> That's a good answer. Good answer. Good answer. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I do love... The Italian film Life is Beautiful. Another extremely oh. sad movie, but it tells it from a different perspective that's not from, you know, the typical Hollywood American, you know, America did everything in the World War II, even though they didn't, um, you know, kind of kind of tale. Uh, it's a, a good movie that follows... It's a, it's a two-parter, so like it follows the, fa the father in the story falling in love with uh, his wife in the first half in the uh, the ghettos of Italy um, and then the second half is him surviving a uh, concentration camp with his son um, and trying to make the best life for his son throughout that and it's just an incredibly beautiful movie in terms of uh, the resilience and, and and the way that they find joy and even the darkest of places so I just, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's one of the first movies that's ever really, like, struck me in the heart, you know, it's with, with how touching it was. Yeah, uh, Life is Beautiful is an incredible film. Uh, Roberto Panini uh, famously won not just uh, Best Film, not in the English language that year. He won Best Actor. Pretty sure it was the first non-English speaking performance to win Best Actor at the Oscars. And I think still only to this day, I would need to double check that one. Also, um, fun fact, he also is the, the director of the movie. Yeah, he is also the director of the movie. Uh, writer, director, star, very talented guy. He starred in a really shitty Pinocchio movie five years later. Uh, insert that terrifying photo of him as Pinocchio here. For me, uh, my favorite movie that takes place during World War II is... It, it, it's kind of a downer on the ending, but it's also a very exhilarating and fun movie. Uh, that is the Steve McQueen starring The Great Escape. Have either of you seen that? No. It's fantastic. I can't recommend it enough. It's like an action movie from 1963 with like exhilarating action sequences that like would still be exhilarating if it was made today. Very ahead of its time with also a bit of a downer ending. I want to elaborate on why it's a bit of a downer ending, but it is a bit of a downer ending. It's a brilliant, brilliant film and I can't recommend it enough. Uh, but if I didn't say The Great Escape, I'd probably say my favorite World War II era movie was Inglorious Bastards, the movie we're talking about today. Uh, you know, that 1972 movie, no, I'm kidding. The movie Tarantino stole the name from. Uh, this is a great movie. I think we can all agree we all like Inglorious Bastards here. Uh, 
So we'll just get into our thoughts with it of it. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Killing Nazis. Starting with you, Mr. Tim. Yeah, um, this much like District 9 was a movie that like I saw shortly after it came out and um, just haven't gotten around to revisiting. Um, but uh, it, it was also a like, I think this was the first Tarantino movie to come out after I had started watching his movies. Like I'd seen Pulp Fiction and Kill Bill shortly before this movie came out. So I was like, oh, he's making a new one. Nice. Um, so I was excited for it. And uh, when I finally watched it, because uh, I, I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it when I came to home video. Um, wow. But, but when, I, when I finally did check it out, um, I, I loved it. Uh, I think it's great. Um, I think if I have any criticism of it, it's that like the marketing for it and knowing who Tarantino is as a director, I was expecting just a little more pulpiness from it. Like when it gets pulpy, it's great. Uh, but it, there is a lot of, um, you know, slow burn leading up to the pulpiness. But, uh, I think it's also fair to say that it all culminates in one of the most satisfying endings uh, of any movie. Um, it's it's so good. Um, just the 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 building burning, all the Nazis getting shot up, and uh, that fucking quote: uh, "I am Shoshana Dreyfus, and this is the face of Jewish vengeance." That is just like one of the hardest fucking quotes I've ever heard. It's so good. Who wants to send a message to Germany? I have a message for Germany that you are all going to die. And I want you to look deep into the face of the Jew who is going to do it. <laughs> My name is Susanna Reifus. And this is the face of Jewish vengeance. And the, the shot of the face, too, is incredible. Um, absolutely love that. And uh, just, just a very kind of cathartic uh, kind of ending. Like, I, I was actually seeing some stuff the other day. Some people were kind of talking about how, I, I, don't, I don't think I care for Tarantino's sort of revisionist history kind of stuff. And, like, I... I can see the arguments against it, but I'm I'm just like whatever. Let's just let's just watch what if the shitty people got what was coming to them instead of you know the realities of it. Uh, that's that's fun sometimes. It's fun here. Uh, there there is also some not some so fun stuff like uh, that opening scene is so fucking tense. One of the greatest like tension building scenes I've seen. And um, Christoph Waltz's performance in this is great. Uh, it's kind of funny after seeing Django Unchained, just because that is the exact opposite character. <laughs> uh, in, in this, he's the Jew hunter, and in that, he is the slave owner hunter. Um, but he does both really well. Uh, shout out Christoph Waltz, great actor. On this viewing, I picked up on some uh, Kill Bill parallels that I guess, for whatever reason, I didn't notice uh, when I first watched it. Pr probably the most on its face of them is there's there's a needle drop when uh, Shoshana is like taking down the stuff on the marquee, and the Nazis are like, "We need to take you to this restaurant." They play a track from the Kill Bill soundtrack, uh, which I thought was interesting. And then later, after the bar shootout, the little like conversation with Wilhelm felt a lot like the uh, the the scene in Kill Bill where um, she just find, finds out she's pregnant. She has to have the conversation with the assassin who came to kill her. Uh, they even have that like same cadence of the character saying, "So let's talk." Big gang is pretty good for a German. I agree. So let's talk. I could blow your fucking head off. Not before I put one right between your eyes. So let's talk. 
which I, th I thought was that that was a neat kind of parallel and then this is less like straightforward parallel just kind of a similarity between the two movies i think it's fair to say a lot of tarantino's films are very primarily english language uh but these two films both are very multilingual like in kill bill you also have some japanese and some chinese and some spanish and uh in this film you have some german and some french and some italian so, so it's just kind of neat to uh, have a little bit of uh, multilingualism in both of these movies. Um, and both both solid pictures. Uh, and Glorious Bastards, I'm definitely glad that I checked it out again. Uh, and uh, yeah, good time. Movie good. Back to you, Tanner. Uh, yeah, all fantastic stuff. I got to agree with it. Uh, Mr. Kedge, man who... Almost forgot to be here today. What do you think of Inglorious Bastards? Um, I think it's a fantastic movie. It's it's probably tied with Django Unchained for my favorite Tarantino movie. Um, and like Tim said, it, it definitely has that Tarantino vibe to it towards the second half of the film. Um, first half is very, like you said, slow burn. Um, kind of just setting the scene for a really long time and then it gets into the, the action where you get that the hyper stylized style that tarantino has like watching this movie though um recently is, is it's not picked up was the irony of the of all the nazis going to the theater to watch a war movie where they make the the nazi out to be like the hero and and you know this macho guy um in the war movie and and the movie you're watching is a war movie where they're making the American hero. It's an American made film where they have the American heroes out to be these macho like hero guys of the entire film. So I think that was a nice little like thing that, that Tarantino has in there to kind of make a point about like how movies will give you that uh, sense of like playing towards its audience and, and making them see what they want to see, you know, whether it's the right or, or true or anything like that in uh, fiction, especially in a movie where he's kind of like like rewriting like a, a, a non-fictional era with with fictional characters and in a fictional restyle of, of the past so yeah back to you yeah all great stuff um my time to shine hello i'd like to preface this by saying something very briefly i think quentin tarantino is an incredible filmmaker i think his works uh his artistic works are all incredibly brilliant and that he's a genius he is also a piece of shit <laughs> true mm -hmm. uh, just throwing that out there uh, the origin of the famous, and this is a slightly racist thing I'm about to say, uh, the butchering of M. Night Shyamalan's last name to be M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong uh, kind of originates with him. Uh, he also lives in Israel half the year, and I will just leave that at that <laughs> about what that means. Uh, but you've heard my opinions about stuff like that before. You understand what I'm saying. That being said, Inglorious Bastards is an incredible work of anti-Nazi shit. Cause you know what is always fun when you're watching a movie with Nazis in it? Watching them lose over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And they get a couple wins at the start, but then they lose, they lose hard. And I think the first thing I wanna to touch on is the alternate history thing, because that's what this movie's known for. And I remember when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was coming out, everyone was talking about, oh, Tarantino is alternate history thing. You know, that thing he's famous for. As far as I can tell, this was the first and only one of two movies where he does that. Yeah, it, it's only, I think, in this movie and in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So it's, I wouldn't say it's the thing he's famous for. So just imagine watching this movie in 2009 and being like, wow, I, how is Hitler going to get himself out of this one? And then he doesn't. How fucking awesome must that have been? <laughs> That must have ruled. The theater scene is sufficiently gnarly. All the little chapters and vignettes are awesome. I like how Michael Fassbender's character shows up and he's like immediately kind of bad at his job. Yeah. Like his accent sucks and he does the the three, th I can't even do it, the three thing. Uh, and then everyone just shoots each other to death in that scene. I like how there's like, Mike Myers is in this movie for a scene. That's kind of awesome. Uh, speaking of, pieces of shit in regards to Israel. Eli Roth is in this movie. And yeah. when we open up general discussion, I'm gonna bring up something about his character. Tim already knows probably what it is. Bennett might not, but he's also, he's pretty good in the movie, I hate to say. 
Uh, BJ Novak is in this, which is funny because every time you see him, you're like, that's that's Ryan from The Office. I always fucking forget BJ Novak is in this. Because you'll like, you'll be at the scene where Brad Pitt is like, we are on a mission. And then you see BJ Novak just in the corner of the screen, like, what the fuck? And then he's like one of the main characters for the last 15, 20 minutes. It's yeah. like he disappears from the movie for a large swath of it. But he's an important part there at the end. He's kind of awesome in the role too. You guys call me the little man? Do you control the nicknames your enemies bestow on you? Aldo the Apache and the little man? What do you mean, the little man? German's nickname for you. The German's nickname for me is the little man? His delivery of that is perfect. Of course, though, when you want to talk about acting in regards to this movie, I once said that Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus is my all-time favorite movie villain. That is true. That is still true. However, if I had to pick an all-time favorite movie villain that's just like a repugnant piece of shit that you can't sympathize for at all, Colonel Hans Landa, played brilliantly by Christoph Waltz in this movie, would probably be my pick. He is a perfect villain. He is terrifying. He is menacing. He is somehow entertaining to watch. And when he gets his fucking forehead Nazi swastika carved in, it feels great. You're mm -hmm. satisfied watching that. <laughs> you know something, you bitch? I think this just might be my masterpiece. Brad Pitt's southern accent in this movie is dog shit. I love it. Kill Nazis. Kill do, you Nazis. Think do you think it's purposely bad, though, just to add more of a comedic effect? It might have been. I don't know with him. I, I think it was done just for, like, the intention of, like, making his character stand out. It makes him stand out. I love him peeking Bonja. He's like, Monjo. Bonjour. It's so funny. It's a journal. It's like, it's like a Southern accent is so bad. It does vaguely resemble an Italian accent. Um, The opening scene that you alluded to earlier, Tim, I mean, alluded to, talked about is brilliant. Every scene of this movie is brilliant. You're, you're just locked in from start to finish. And quite frankly, I, I, I'm running out of steam here and I kind of just want to get into general discussion because there's a big thing I want to talk about. So we'll get back into the movie right after a brief commercial break. Bye. Welcome back from that ad break for another ad. See that thing right there? That's a movie palette. That one's a punch drunk love, but you can get one of your own for any one of the movies on moviepalette.com. What's there's a movie a bunch... palette, Tanner? Movie palette is basically when they take the, the frame of every movie, take the primary color, like the color that stands out the most, slice it up in these little chunks, and put it all in a row like that thing right there. That's for the movie Punch Drunk Love. Above Tim, you can see one for the movie Mandy. Uh, and you can order one of your own for any one of the many movies they have in stock or for a little extra, you can custom request a movie. You just gotta go to moviepalette.com, add it to your cart. But before you check out, enter the code SQUAD15 to save 15% on your order. Now back to the show. So who knows who Quentin Tarantino originally wanted to play the Bear Jew? don't know me you don't wait tim you legitimately don't know this i don't think so no he wanted me to play it but i had a conflicting schedule yeah you, well, it's funny you bring up conflicting schedule because that's the reason why his original choice couldn't do the part yeah i couldn't get out too, of my fifth grade classroom in time he was too busy filming the 2009 movie funny people because originally quentin tarantino wanted none other than adam fucking sandler to play the bear jew and was Sandler amazing. wanted oh. to do it. He was busy. You did not know that, Tim? No. Well, you got to tell me what you're thinking. That that would have that would have been interesting. Uh, I would have liked it. He has like Sandler. Like, there's a couple of scenes in there, like especially when he's talking, when he's like cursing out the Nazi when he's beating him with the bat. That I could just imagine in that classic Sandler voice. Just <laughs> so, yeah, doing it in his Sandler voice. That'd be so funny. It would it would so fit with the Sandler voice. It would have been incredible. Yeah! It'd been even better to have him doing it with like a golf club, bringing like a little Happy Gilmore. Did you see uh, that they're working on a Happy Gilmore too? Oh, so hyped. Yeah, Travis Kelsey's going to be in it, and that's all I know. There's a bunch of other people who have been rumored to be in it, but I haven't uh, I haven't paid attention to that much. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they almost actually didn't make this movie because they thought that Colonel Hans Landa was a role that no actor could play until they met Christoph Waltz. 
Yeah, he has like a very specific energy and like, yeah, I, I can't imagine anyone else doing what he does here. I couldn't either. He is so like singular in that way. Do you want to know another uh, fact? I would love to know another fact. You know, in the scene and uh, the two towers, when he kicks the helmet, he actually breaks his toe. I, you know, I didn't know that. And that helmet was actually Christoph Waltz. Yeah, there we go. The action scenes in this movie are great. Mm. I yeah. think it's some of the, like the best action stuff of his career. I don't know if I'd go that far. Like as, as, the Kill Bill stand of the group, like that. I Kill Bill is for, pretty sweet. Yeah, you Kill Bill. Okay, <laughs> if you don't count the actual action movie he made, um, yeah, they, say, have they made the, like one of the best action movies of all time? <laughs> yeah, like, this is the best you don't work. count the action movie. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it does have some great action, like kind of what I was saying. I think going into it from the marketing of it, uh, I was just thinking, oh, it's just gonna be uh, the bastards killing Nazis the whole movie. Uh, and that's not quite what it is, but when they do get to kill the Nazis, it is very fun to watch. I like how like detached the scalping always feels. Yeah. Like it's disturbing every time you just look over because like obviously it's Nazis, so fuck them, but it's still like uncomfortable watching that happen. Yeah, it's like part part of you is still like, ouch, that that looks extremely excruciating, but at the same time, it, part of you is like dehumanizing the Nazis too. Yeah, but I mean, like they kind of deserve to be dehumanized. No, that's what I'm saying. They bit. deserve it, but it's still like disturbing to witness. Yeah, you know, fucking Daniel Bruhl is in this movie, and I think this was like his first big role in Hollywood. Uh, the kiddies back home might know him best as Baron Zemo in Civil War and Captain America or Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, fun fact about Daniel Bruhl's character, when he auditioned for this role, he uh, wasn't actually that fluent in French. So whenever he wasn't sure when he was auditioning for Tarantino, what he would do was just mix in some Spanish with the French, assuming correctly that Tarantino wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I mean, Val. You can you can just mix in any amount of French, Spanish, and Italian words, and it will probably sound mostly correct. Um, did you guys know that Leonardo the Cap Leonardo DiCaprio Leonardo uh, DiCaprio apparently was Tarantino's first pick for Colonel Hans Landa? He then went, "Nah, it should be someone German." Yeah, I can I can see it, especially because like I know that he ended up you know working with. Uh, Leo for Django um, and he, he plays a similar kind of character in Django um, and he does it very well but yeah I think I think Christoph Waltz uh, was perfect for Londa. Yeah it's hard to imagine like literally again anyone else in that role. Um, all the roles quite frankly are perfect even again Eli Loth who I don't really like much he's kind of great in this. Yeah yeah it's I, I do think that role could have been played by someone else. I, I would be interested to see the version where Adam Sandler plays that role. Um, but, like, he does play it well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just fun to watch a large Jewish man cave in a Nazi skull. It's always fun watching a large Jewish man cave in a Nazi skull and collect 10,000 Nazi scalps. There you go. Um... When I watched this Monday night, it was my first time watching it in years. Mm. You forget how funny the movie is in parts. Yeah. Specifically, like how fake humble Daniel Brühl's character is, is really funny to me. He's like, apparently I'm something of a movie star, you know, whatever. But bitch, you are milking it. You, you know what you're doing. Yeah. I remember when like the trailers for this were coming out, just all of those uh, commercials had the 999 followed by Brad Pitt going, oh, yes, yes, yes. Nine, 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 nine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You glorious bastard. That's and great. Oh, it's so funny, the smash cut to 999. 999. I also, like, love the classic part that, like, most people liked where they, he's, he's talking about them, uh, getting prepared to go to the cinema. And he's like, he's like, you'll be the, 
you'll be the uh, third best speaking Italian. And he's like, I don't speak Italian. Like I said, third best. Yeah, <laughs> That's so funny. Or um, uh, that entire sequence where he's like talking down the bartender guy, or not the bartender, but the young soldier. And it's like, we got a deal, don't we? Hey, I thought we had a deal. And then Diane Kruger shoots him to shit anyway. Yeah. Uh, I also, I did love that uh, that guy's name was Wilhelm, and then when they're watching the film, you can hear Wilhelm scream at one point. Uh, that that just tickled my funny bone. Oh, I was thinking that too. I was like, oh my god, the character's name is Wilhelm. That's funny. What's your name, soldier? Wilhelm. That's amazing that the Wilhelm scream was like, you know, around that long ago yeah in the 40s that's crazy so then it wasn't it first like made for star wars it was, it was first some, made it was some like some, 50s like, movie i think where it was man getting eaten by a crocodile it was a part of several sound effects sound takes recorded for that session the wilhelm scream in question was made for that movie but wasn't actually used in that movie however a sound effect from that recording session made its way into the studio archives and another movie in which there is a character named Private Wilhelm is killed. So they implemented the scream there, which is where it got the Wilhelm scream name. And then it kind of became an end joke with audio engineers to just stick it into this uh, little ranky dank movie. Uh, and then as H Bomber guy put it, there was another uh, audio engineer guy that was working on this little rinky dinky indie film that wasn't expected to do much craziness and then oops that movie was star wars culture is forever changed and you've made one of the biggest movie easter eggs of all time now yeah i love just like how much is going on here you know yeah i love how hans landa like he immediately realizes i'm cooked the allies are definitely winning this war let me get out of here with a good deal i just think that's funny mm. I, I think it's kind of interesting how like the the whole like chapter thing is something that Tarantino does in a lot of his movies but I think in here um there are so many like different stories with different sets of characters going on that it, like is a really good divider for like all the different stories going on uh also I just I'm very surprised that like title card for chapter four Operation Kino is not a meme in like movie circles yeah like how have i how do i not see that on every film twitter thread i i think it's important that it's split up into chapters especially because it helps you like remember that there are actually multiple plots to assassinate everyone in the theater there is the yeah. allied powers plot and then there's just this this jewish lady's plot in revenge yeah. they are separate plots because yeah. if you think about it hans landa could have alerted the german high command about what was going on and it might not have mattered. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, go, going back to like the, the Shoshana's plot of, yeah, we're just gonna lock them in and burn the 350 reels of film, uh, and uh, the Samuel L. Jackson voiceover just kind of explaining how flammable film is. Uh, so for our younger viewers who are maybe born after the 21st century, uh, when I was a kid and I would go to the movie theaters, it was fucking freezing because they had to keep that shit, they had to keep the AC blasting to keep the films from catching fire. Just, just to illustrate how flammable movies are, because uh, movie theaters are hot now, they don't they don't AC that shit as much anymore. But uh, in the 90s and before then, blasting AC just to keep the films from catching fire. Which is why during the Great Depression, movie theaters were considered a great place to hang out because it was a relatively affordable way to get inside a building that had guaranteed air conditioning because you needed air conditioning to run a movie theater. So yeah, 350 reels of film. Uh, yeah, that is that is gonna burn that shit like kindling. Almost like just basically being a bomb. It's almost just a bomb. Yeah. The bombs weren't necessary. <laughs> yeah. The guns weren't necessary. It was just satisfying seeing Hitler get shot to 72 times. Yes. So, the Michael Fassbender character. Did you know an original actor 
was set to play that character, a different actor other than Fassbender. Ooh. I Which just found this out that? myself. Uh, he, he, Michael Fassbender was the guy was the spy that got caught on like immediately oh, because yeah, he yeah. had a shitty accent. Um, uh, the actor had to drop out because of scheduling conflicts with the adventures of Tintin. I'm just finding this out. Simon fucking Peg was originally set to play that character. And, that, huh? That would have been very funny. Um, especially since that character, like, meets up with Mike Myers. I could, I could see that, because, like, that, that's another thing with Tarantino is, like, he, he loves to just, like, do some goofy shit in his movies. Like, they're, they're not overly serious. He, he likes to have his fun. And I could definitely see him doing a movie where Simon Pegg plays a shitty spy. Yeah, no, I could 100% see Simon Pegg as that character, but I also think it would be a radically different Oh yeah, the, scene. The... Like, because Simon Pegg wouldn't bring like that. Ser- no offense to Simon Pegg, he's not a serious actor. He's more of a comedic guy. Yeah, no, the the tone would not be as deadly serious, but it would be very funny. What what do you think of that, Bennett? Sorry, what? <laughs> what did you think of Simon Pegg originally being the actor to play that character? Oh, I would have much rather seen that. Would have been interesting. There's a yeah. lot of alternate castings with this one. At least those are I, the I don't think it's I don't think it'd be as interesting as obviously Sandler as the Jew Bear because they're like, I don't know, thinking back to like what you were saying, him doing his like Adam Sandler voice. Um, that that well, like I think being the dude down was so funny. Like now, now that we have uncut gems, I think him bringing that uncut gems energy into that performance could have been interesting. He's still snubbed, like oh, he should have been not. Na- he should have like the biggest won snub the Oscar, of the Academy. Let alone be nominated. The biggest snub of the Academy's ever. Uh, it's one of them. There's a lot of bullshit snubs. Yeah, yeah. that you 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 hate to see. So here's something interesting. Eli Roth put on 35 pounds of muscle to play the bear Jew. Would Adam Sandler have put on 35 pounds of muscle or 35 pounds? Both. So 70 pounds total? Yes. Yeah, there we go. He is cultivating mass, all right. That that's how he becomes the bear Jew. Also, he's gay in this version. He's gay in this version. He just comes out as a little bear. It's just a CGI bear with Adam Sandler voicing it. There we go. That's Operation Kino right there. That that would have been. Uh, yeah, how is that not a meme? That's crazy that it's not a meme. We're gonna make it a meme. Gorlami. 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 Of course, to see a milore peti on cora. Gorlami. Excuse me. Gorlami. Did you know that Tarantino didn't know Diane Kruger was German? He was I nervous that Diane Kruger was like not gonna be right for the part because he was like, oh man, can she even speak in a convincing German accent? not knowing she was German. Quentin Tarantino gonna Quentin Tarantino. Did you guys know that uh, Rod Taylor, the actor that plays Winston Churchill in this movie for like the one or two scenes he's in, uh, had actually just fully retired from acting until Tarantino was like, come on, man, please. Gotta love when that happens sometimes. Like, uh, I know Mel Brooks is trying to do that with uh, Rick Moranis, get him in Spaceballs too. Uh, now Spaceballs 2 is a whole different thing. Wasn't that the same thing with Matt Damon where he was like, I'm not going to act unless Christopher Nolan calls. And then he called for Oppenheimer. Yeah, that was the thing is that Matt Damon was like promising his wife, babe, I'm going to take a break. I will only get back in it if it's for Christopher Nolan. And then like the next day or maybe even that same day, it was Chris Nolan calling Matt Damon. Matt, I'd love for you to be in my film. She's like, oh my God, babe, you're going to hate me. Babe, I'm so (laughs) sorry. You're going to hate me. Uh, It's been a while since I've seen this movie. So when I was watching this movie and the narrator started talking, it took me like a minute. And but before I went, Sam Jackson, I forget every time that Don Cheadle, I forget every time that it's Sam Jackson. It's kind of like in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. There's no narrator for most of that. And then there is one and it's Kurt Russell. Yeah, it is in that movie before then, but still. That, that that is another like almost Kill Bill connection because like in Volume Two, 
a Sam Jackson appears for like one scene where he's just like, uh, I, I do the piano for the wedding uh, and then everybody there gets killed. Tarantino wanted this to be like one of his first movies like he made, period. I mean, this is definitely the kind of movie that I don't think anyone can make as their first movie. Like, the, the You big, need, like, proof. Yeah, the, the big, like, war, war set, the wartime movie is something that you need to build up to, and, like, um, you, you gotta start with his gangster movies, and then got to do his martial arts grindhouse movie, and then he got to do his other grindhouse movie and then at that point it was like okay we'll we'll let you we'll let you make your your big piece so tarantino had actually planned to begin production of this movie in 2005 after the kill bills and after his gangster movies but um he delayed production so he could act in uh takeshi mckay's western film uh western western django Mm -hmm. tarantino's just an actor in this japanese movie uh yeah it's kind of cool I think I've seen that uh, one. I think I have too? I don't know. Then he was going to make a kung fu movie that was entirely in Mandarin. That never happened. Uh, just like a Star Trek movie never happened. He then did Death Proof. And then he finally went on to do Inglorious Bastards. And, and it's kind of crazy because like, what a crazy movie this is. Like, <laughs> yeah, this movie yeah. is insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it has a very simple birth point of just this idea of what if a band of Jewish soldiers just went and started killing Nazis that'd be fun wouldn't it and then just kind of spiraled from there just got bigger and bigger and like you you do you do have the fun pulpy stuff but it's all kind of packaged in this kind of bigger story about the Nazis and uh, this Jewish woman who was plotting to get her revenge. Yeah. I mean, in conclusion, it's just an amazing movie. I love it. Let's get into our final thoughts on Inglorious Bastards. Bennett, we'll start with you. This is a, it's a fun movie. It's it's always a fun watch every time I've seen it. Every time I watch it, I always I always find something new about it. Um, that like, you know, Tarantino's stuck in there because that's, that's how pretty much all his movies are where there's always some kind of like little Easter egg or something like that you can pick up on it. But this one's just a fun one to watch, especially because it's got that, you know, like hoorah, you know, kill the Nazis kind of spirit to it. And it's just everybody can enjoy it because like what's what's better than watching, you know, a bunch of bad guys getting, you know, destroyed and losing. On to Tim. Yeah. Yeah, Tim, final thoughts. Nazi punks, Nazi punks, Nazi punks. Fuck off. I agree. Nazi punks can fuck off. This is an amazing film. It is my favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. And fuck Nazis. You know who else says fuck Nazis? Your mom. You. Yes, my mom. But also you, the person watching slash listening to this episode of Bomb Squad Matinee. Thank you very much for tuning in as always. If you're listening to this on any of the ad platforms we're on, we very much appreciate it. Go ahead and leave us a review. It boosts us in the algorithm. How about if you're listening, mosey on down over to our Patreon. Throw some bucks this way. Five dollars commentary track supposed to come out this month we've had some internal problems so it might come out next month but the goal is still this month but commentary tracks will be launching soon and if you donate ten dollars you'll get a special shout out at the end of episodes jason secord thank you very much for your continued support and tanya craft my own mother thank you as well for your support we really appreciate it and if you're watching this on youtube thank you very much for watching comment below and let me know what's your favorite world war ii movie uh what do you think of inglorious bastards what uh how good do you think adam sandler would have been as the bear jew how crazy would simon Pegg would have been and uh finally fuck nazis yes no yes comment below and let me know and while you're down there hit the like button so we know how much you like us hit the subscribe button so we know how much you love us and hit the bell icon so you know exactly when we upload new videos thank you so much for watching see you next time bye arrivederci Sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.